at this. The view from my hotel room is completely insane. We've got the ocean, the palm trees, there's a little fountain. Am I here for some much needed, much deserved rest? R&R, beach vacation. Did I get a job on the new season of White Lotus? You must be new here. This is a work trip. We're on the big island of Hawaii. Not sure why they call it that. Not far from Kona, which most endurance athletes have of course heard of. But don't worry, there won't be any triathlon in this video. We're here as we do for a climb. Mauna Kea, the longest, toughest climb in the world. We're gonna go from the beach, which I understand it is zero feet sea level, all the way up to over 14,000 feet through all kinds of climate zones and a brutal dirt section. I have been here before. I did Mauna Kea New Year's Eve 2016, technically my last day as a pro. I've done all kinds of crazy training rides and epic mountains in my retirement. This is the one I think of every day. I definitely had my foot on the gas, I was pushing hard, but it was a very emotional day for me. I was stopping and taking photos. And not a lot of folks have given it a serious crack. I got the KOM by two hours. I had an office job lined up, but it was this ride that kind of showed me there's all kinds of stuff to bike riding that's not just a couple countries in Europe and racing. This climb inspired me to start a YouTube channel, collect a bunch of sponsors, and do this whole afterlife that's just been so incredible and meaningful. So I didn't film it, but everything you've seen on my channel has a little bit of Mauna Kea in it. And I'd always planned to go back. My thought was my final episode of Worst Retirement Ever would be on Mauna Kea, but I didn't think it would last eight years and counting. Then, over Christmas, a World Tour rider named Larry Warbass took my KOM, which was the push I needed to come back with a camera. Now, I guess you could start like in Florida and go all the way up to Pikes Peak and call that the longest climb in the world, but from a pure one-day ride perspective, this is it. I've done Letras in Colombia, that's like three and a half hours. I've done the Taiwan KOM challenge, that's similar. It's an adventure, and there's nothing like it. Can I go faster this time than my 2016 self? We'll find out. Either way, it's gonna be an awesome time. I mean painful. You know what I mean. I'm Phil Gunn. I was a pro cyclist for 10 years, racing all over the world. Now I'm retired, but I'm not done suffering on my bike, climbing mountains as fast as I can, and going on crazy adventures. I couldn't be the best at racing, and I'm definitely the worst at retiring. Welcome to Worst Retirement Ever. You might notice a little location change from my previous clips. That's because I'm in an Airbnb. So I booked these non-refundable flights, and then I noticed that the hotels in Kona are insanely expensive. I finally found an Airbnb that was like reasonable-ish, but it was some kind of timeshare condo thing, and they'd asked me to fill out a bunch of forms for the front desk, and I had just missed that email. So it's like nine o'clock on Sunday night, and I looked like, okay, where am I going now? Let's pull up the directions to Airbnb. And I realized that I have no reservation. They'd canceled my booking because I hadn't sent them the forms. I request to book a couple other Airbnbs real quick. But of course, that takes a while. And everyone who owns condos here lives on the East Coast. So they're like five hours ahead. They're asleep. I ended up booking the cheapest hotel room that I could find. It was $800 a night. And then my friend Alice Candelario had left a car for me to use at the airport, but the directions that he gave to find the car were from the United part, and I flew into Delta. So I walked around that airport for an hour and a half just trying to find the car. And of course, I've got two bikes. I'm pushing one of those terrible little carts. It kept falling off the sidewalk. Eventually, I just hid all of my luggage in the bushes and found the car, drove back to get them. It's pitch black. It's the middle of the night. I'll be honest, I cried a little bit. So I stayed at the fake White Lotus for two nights. You better believe I took all of the pens, used every Nespresso pod, and then I transferred to a much more reasonable and very nice Airbnb nearby. So let's get to the morning of the attempt. An early morning start in Hawaii isn't the worst thing in the world because it is two hours earlier here meaning I could just stay on LA time and wake up naturally at four in the morning, which would be an absolute hard no at home. So I don't have the fitness that I had from the world tour. What I do have is one piece Starlight speed suit on down here. I've got a fueling plan. The maids are probably used to this. I have a new benchmark time and have much better equipment options. I have a kick-ass squad today. Uh, Dan, local triathlete and Nick, we worked together last time I was here. I showed up here, I actually had, I believe it might have been one of the first production disc brake bicycles. And I can tell you exactly where in my house I left my through axle. And it's like at that time, no one had extra through axles. There were no through axles. And what did you use to make it rideable? A fork spacer for packing. <sighs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> it was metal. 
It was. It was a quality floor yeah, spacer. Yeah, you were like, I think this will be fun, and then it was. We are prepared. In case I brought six bikes with no through axles, you were all set. We were ready to go. <laughs> so today I do have my through axle. I checked twice. Nice. Good, good. <laughs> uh, let's do a quick bike check because I did assemble these yesterday in a parking lot uh, in a state of general exhaustion. Yes. Dan, forgive me. How do we pronounce your last name? Gampon. Gampon, yeah. okay. <laughs> you don't have to tell me what it rhymes with. <laughs> Must have been long for you in middle school. My last right. name's Gay Man. Started triathlon when I was 17. I was just a local boy. Just wanted to do something. We're a bunch of kids. Just yeah. Do so if your kids crazy. here and you see all these triathletes coming, you think the triathlon is cool. Yeah, and the, uh, we thought we could be better than that too. Right. Triathlon's cool. Um, no, it, it is. It is. So my best friends are triathletes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It changed my life. It brought me so many opportunities. I met the love of my life through triathlon. There you go. Um, she's now my wife. We raced around the world, Austria and Europe. We went to South Neat. Africa together, New Zealand and Australia. My last triathlon was last March. Been running a lot because uh, I've been work working for the brand Hoka. Yep. Trying to stay fit, do crazy stuff and Beautiful. People like you, yeah. It's good. Yeah. So while Nick is uh, checking over the bikes, I'll give you a quick inventory, Dan. We've got uh, five bottles of the high carb mix that I will be asking for out the window. Uh, spare mix, there's a jug of water in there if we need more. Various camera things, batteries, cards, and whatnot. We have a note from my doctor. I'm told that the park rangers are telling folks they need to stop and acclimate. Larry was stopped. So I don't know if this will work, <laughs> but we have a doctor's note. Uh, we've got spare wheels in the car and we've got, God bless me, running shoes if it gets too real on the dirt section. What'd you have for breakfast this morning? I had a Spam Musubi wrap. Is that bad? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I approve. Tell me when I get it wrong. It's, uh, it's, it's rice and then there's like a fried Spam little Correct. at the bottom. Correct. And then it's wrapped in seaweed. Yeah, wrapped in uh, nori. Nori. Yeah, seaweed, the first seaweed. time I was like, this is gross. And now uh, something I absolutely look forward to coming here. I like to do what the locals <laughs> do, you know? <laughs> and there was some conversation, I dare say criticism, about my shoe choice here, my Hirachis. This is not a sponsor. I want you to know these were handmade in Bucerias. The soles are used car tires and they're awesome. So the tradition is to dip your bike in the water at the bottom. Do I have to get my toes wet too? Just a little bit. It's cold? No, oh, it's lovely. That's done. Go! No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the segment starts up there. Through those clouds, actually, you could see the observatory if it was clear. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it's that high. They're laughing at me right now. When's the last time these things erupted? Well, Mauna Loa uh, 2020, but before that was like decades. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of lava rock over there. Uh, Phil, it, we're literally on top of lava. <laughs> it's, it's all <laughs> around us. Yeah. I, if you if you look at the, I mean, everything here is insanely expensive, but if you look at like the houses to buy them, like you can get beachfront property and it's like weirdly cheap. And then you realize it's because you can't insure it because it's a you, volcano. <laughs> you definitely never know because you got one, two, yeah, three four literally around us <laughs> how often do you think about getting killed by a volcano like not trying to be a dick that's, yeah it's a good question i, I mean not uh, not not often as we, we every earthquake think. i think about it i i've grown up with like earthquakes here and there and to me it seems like normal yeah but then to like the average person that's like oh my god like are we gonna die right now yeah yeah, I don't um, love an earthquake, but it, but yeah, I'm used to them now. I'll leave them too. What you love to do is start a five-hour ride with wet, sandy feet. Yeah. I'll have more things to complain about very soon. <laughs> <You like that? laughs> this will be the least of my concerns. All right, let's do it. Segment starts right over there. So we start in Waikoloa Village, which is on the Kona side. I should mention here that you can also go for the KOM from the Hilo side of the island. The Hilo side is less distance, meaning a steeper average gradient. Drake Duel does have that KOM, but the first time I was here, there was construction on that highway, so I did the Kona side, and that kind of became the one that folks were going for. From the Waikoloa Beach parking lot, you head over to the Queen K Highway, named for Queen Kaamanu, who ruled Hawaii in the early 1800s, which is when the white man came, along with missionaries and Christianity, which kind of brought Hawaii from tribal leadership to the more modern, now state. So they named a highway after her, which goes all the way around the island. Then you make a right turn onto Waikoloa Road. This is the first long stretch of the time, and when I started to look at my Wahoo, my power meter. 
The altitude on my graphic here does not do it justice, but the Wahoo Live segment does. As you can see, you're climbing the whole day, but it's very backloaded, with the steepest part closer to the end, which also happens to be gravel. Or ash. Or something. It's not pavement. The climb is about 56 miles, but really the first 40 are all highway. Very exposed and very subject to wind. So of course, I had a headwind. I was looking at the live segment, I was looking at my PR versus the KOM. Right away, I was way up on my PR, and I was starting to put a little bit of time into Larry. The most important part of the beginning, of course, was to not go too hard. Like any KOM, it's easy to push too much early on, but for a five hour effort, I knew it was about being conservative and being as fresh as possible for that last section at 10,000 plus feet. When I first lost the KOM, I called my coach Frank Overton and I asked him to look through my old power file, look at Larry's, and see, is it possible to get this back? We both did good average power and a hard study effort, but of course, neither 2016 me nor Larry Warbass were doing a five hour concerted time trial. So my advantage would just be that mental focus for five hours. And then of course, we both agreed that the gravel bike would make a huge difference compared to walking. Waikoloa Road is 12 miles and ends at 2,400 feet. I got there in just over 47 minutes, about 30 seconds up controlled my power at just 320 watts and a heart rate of 160. I knew I'd be passing through five climate zones, so I told myself, don't overdo it, you'll get through this climate zone and you'll have less wind or a tailwind in the next one. It sounds nice, but apparently that's not how climate zones work. This is a long climb, so I'm gonna pop in once in a while and do a new section that I wanna call Half-Assed Wikipedia Research. This highway is named for Daniel Inouye. He was an American soldier, the first US representative for the state of Hawaii, and later a senator. This is a long section and a tough climb just by itself. 21 miles, 4,200 feet. I did it in an hour 20 with an average power at 310 watts and the heart rate still buzzing at 160. And yes, climate zones be damned, it was still a headwind, but I was able to take more time out of Larry, making sure I was doing a smooth, steady effort. At this point, we're at 6,500 feet, a little higher than the city of Boulder, Colorado, but for altitude and distance, we're not even halfway there. But for me, it was all about staying on top of my carbohydrates, keeping fueled and hydrated. Finally, you make that left turn onto Mauna Kea Access Road. By now, we're around 8,000 feet. After the left turn, the gradient starts to kick up. And honestly, I was looking forward to that part because at least the wind wouldn't bother me anymore. All day you're looking at that yellow bit on the live segment on the Wahoo. Here's where it finally turns red. And it's gonna be red till the end. I'm only pushing 275 watts, but I'm taking big time out of the KOM here. We talk about climate zones, this feels entirely different from the bottom, which feels entirely different from the middle. Suddenly you're surrounded by pine trees, and it feels like Big Bear or Tenerife if you threw in some volcano rocks. I did look around and see some weird stuff on the highway. There's lots of wild roaming goats and sheep for some reason. We also saw some native nene geese. Did you get the nene's? Those were nene's, right? Yeah. I got a pueo, the Hawaiian owl. Oh, it's back there? That. Way down there, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna stop talking now. That's right. Thanks. Yeah. While we're talking about wild animals, I should mention that I did see some whales from the window of my hotel. And you'd better for $800 a night. If there's no whales, you'd better hire me some robot whales, actor whales. At that price, I should get the full free willy experience. They were humpbacks, but I admit, they were really cool. gel in there somewhere. I'll grab it. I think it's right behind the seat if it's not in the bag I gave you. Okay. I'm about 12 minutes up when we reach the ranger station. Now I was warned about this. Larry was warned about this. When I get there, there's cones and there's rangers kind of flagging at me. So I stopped real quick. I shouted, I'm acclimated. And the note said that, but of course I'm not acclimated. It was snowing in Big Bear. I wasn't gonna go up there to acclimate. And besides, that's only acclimating at 7,000 feet. We're up at 11 now. No one's acclimated to that. They spotted my support car and asked if they would fill out the form that was required for me to get up. I said, yes, no problem. But there were problems. The dirt starts around the corner. I didn't see Dan and Nick behind me. I figured they were just filling out some forms. But about 10, 15 minutes later, a ranger drives up next to me. He says, hey, is that your support car back there? I told him, yes. And he said, well, they're not coming up. 
that's a commercial vehicle, no commercial vehicles allowed. Now I knew there were restrictions on the type of car, it has to be a four wheel drive. This was the exact vehicle that followed me with no problem in 2016, with much worse conditions. They check to make sure the car is clean, they say they're worried about invasive species, but the reality is there's only one invasive species that they want to keep off the mountain, and you're looking at them. See, for the ancient Hawaiians, the pre-Queen K times, only royalty was allowed at the top of Mauna Kea. Since it became a state, they put a giant observatory at the top. That was controversial for the locals. So the last thing they want is a ton of tourists going back and forth, with or without Lycra. But they saw the Big Island Bike Tour stickers on the side, deemed a commercial vehicle. I told the ranger, that's just an old sticker. I borrowed a car from my friend. He just said, well, it's not coming up. Then he asked me, do you have enough food and water to get to the top? I thought, that's nice. He's going to offer me some hydration. There's all these signs on the way up about how altitude sickness is a real thing and you can die from it. I thought, this guy really cares about my safety. So I said, not without my support vehicle, I don't. He did not reach out with a jug of water. He said, well, you'd better think about that. The dude clearly just wanted me to turn around. I'm not going to lie. I thought about it. Distance wise, we're about two thirds through. But I remember looking down and seeing, I'd only been riding two hours and 12 minutes, realizing we're not even halfway there on time. Not to mention, I flew out here with a gravel bike just for this 10 kilometer section where I know I would be walking. I had the thought that I have a 12 minute lead on the KOM. One option I had was to ride back down to where the car was parked. I could grab the gravel bike, put two bottles on there, fill my pockets, and then turn back around. But that would just be giving five minutes away. That bike is set up for road conditions, 24C tubular tires, 100 PSI. I'd probably be walking a little more, but realistically, both me and Larry are walking in our road cycling shoes, and how much faster could he possibly walk than I could? And then part of me also thought, this is kind of perfect. I came here with multiple bikes with support to do my best possible time on this climb, but fuck all that, my nutrition plan, hydration plan, out the window. Just me, by myself, at 10,000 feet, pushing my bike. If I'm gonna get this KOM, now's my time to earn it. The next two hours were probably the longest two hours of my life. A lot of the dirt was rideable, then you get to a section that was just too steep, just too loose, swing the leg over, and just start pushing the thing. Get through it, let it flatten out. And when I say flatten out, I'm talking 9% instead of 13. Clip back in and keep grinding. Looking at the power file, I think I got off my bike nine times. And the worst part of that is, after pushing your bike for a few minutes, you know, you're using your back, your shoulders, and kind of one leg more than the other because the bike's on the right side. A few times I would clip in and start pedaling, and legs would be like, oh no, you're not. You see, up to that point, all day I'd been drinking the first endurance high carb electrolyte mix, but I noticed one little flaw in their science. You must have it on your bicycle to drink it. So even though I just got back on the bike, I got to unclip, stand there, and just kind of like wait for the pain to subside enough that I can bend my legs. I'm not gonna say I didn't think about turning back every time that happened. At one point I was passed by a few looked like tourist hikers going up to the top. It was like, hey, what are you training for? And I'm just pushing my bike. This is it. He goes, yeah, I thought so. You want anything? I said some water would be incredible. Somehow in my dumb brain at 11,000 feet, I thought he would pour it into my bottle while I was riding, but he just stopped the car because of course this dude does not know how to do a feed while driving. So I laid the bike down, walked back, filled the jug, there goes 30 seconds. I kept thinking about that gravel bike just sitting on the back of the car, not just for the tires, but also for the easier gearing. And I thought about those running shoes, which honestly might've been faster on that part than having a bike at all. I believe with Drake Duel's Hilo KOM, he handed someone his bike, ran it solo, switched shoes and took his bike back for the paid section. That might be the fastest way up. I think the Strava Purist would kill me if I did that. <clears throat> so there's really no good way to do this climb, which is kind of what makes it awesome. The pure way, which I did entirely on accident, is just one dude, one bike, pushing it if I have to. For the last four miles, the dirt section is over, and I can tell you, I've never been happier to see pavement in my entire life. You can see the observatory when the pavement starts, but I could tell that's 3,000 feet up and about 45 minutes away. Time for some quick half-assed Wikipedia research. This is the Keck Observatory, built in 1993 and 96, named after William Keck, who was the founder of the Superior Oil Company. He did pretty well. He funded this observatory, medical school at UCLA, and the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. When it was built, this was the largest telescope in the world, and some pretty cool science happens here. This part, from 12,000 to 14,000 feet, with no food and water, I averaged 212 watts, and honestly, I'm not embarrassed about that. I saw that I got the KOM by a healthy seven minutes, but that was very quickly ruined by an additional boss in this video game, which is the question, how the hell am I gonna get down? I thought I'd be getting a ride down in Kando's car with Nick and Dan, and no one wants to do a loose 14% gravel descent on rim brakes. Thank you very much. And meet my new best friends. <laughs> I, I caught them on the descent, like right at the dirt, and they stopped me. Well, I can't believe you rode up there. We passed them going, oh, look at that crazy dirt. Jesus, <laughs> boy. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Oh, Have a great wow. day. Hey, I'm going to pass it on to a stranger. <laughs> 
we're driving down to this is a this isn't a terrible view at all but that's that's Haleakla that's Maui this isn't foreshadowing I want to get there but I have no plans but I do want to get there so I went back to the hotel for my final thoughts here I'm not sure if I mentioned this but it was $800 a night so I'm getting my money's worth now, rules are rules, of course. I don't want to make it sound like I'm just complaining about the park rangers. Mauna Kea is a complicated place. If you think about like the history of Hawaii, they were doing just fine. And then the white man came over and America came over and they built all these military bases. And they kind of sexualized and commoditized the culture and reduced it to luau's and grass skirts. And now they want the volcano too. So I get it, and I'm gonna say this. Maybe think about not coming. Unless you're a very experienced rider, I wouldn't even necessarily say that this is a safe or healthy thing to do. So maybe the best way to experience this climb is watching it like you are now. And I'm not trying to gatekeep. You saw all the things that went wrong. I'm gonna lose this KOM. I didn't come back here for the KOM. I came for the video. When I lose it, I'll be happy for the next guy. All respect to Larry. This is athletically low-hanging fruit. Now there's a Venn diagram of ability, effort, and will. The will was the part that came in the last hour. I've always been honest, there's plenty of folks who have more ability than a 38-year-old retired pro. It's just a matter of time until they put in the effort and the will to get up that climb. Now, one person isn't gonna make or break the whole culture here. If you must come, Big Island Bike Tours is there for you. Nick is still here. Just know the history and be respectful. I wanna thank Nick, Dan, and Kando, Kevin Sistrom, whose idea this was in the first place. Instagram was his idea. I think climbing Mauna Kea was a better one. All right, I'm gonna go raid the mate's cart. I wanna end it with, with mahalo. What does mahalo mean? Like, thank you and hope to see you again. All right, cheers. Mahalo. Nick, get a mahalo in. Mahalo. Yeah, buddy.